everybody at this point in America who reads a newspaper or watches television knows a little bit about Senator Specter. But I want to focus on uh, a couple of things in introducing him. Uh, first of all, he has managed to climb to these heights, overcoming the disabilities of a law school education at a mediocre law school somewhere in New Haven, as I recall. And also, he has survived, uh, having been a classmate and a friend all these years of our own George Freeman. So that, uh, we all know that that's a significant achievement in every possible way. His work on the Senate Judiciary Committee through so many challenging times has been something that's been watched with fascination across the United States. Uh, I didn't know uh, two things, Senator, when we invited you to speak. Uh, I didn't know that we would be on the eve of another United States Supreme Court justice nominee, putting you once again at the epicenter of things. And I didn't know you'd be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as I've thought about it, uh, I want to uh, talk about one other thing for a moment. As I've thought about it, I think in a way, uh, given the enormous need or requirement for bipartisanship, I mean this in a very serious way, to solve the problems of the country, you may be our first postmodern senator. <laughs> the one thing I want to talk about actually uh, before the senator comes up is the enormous courage that he has had, not just in his political career, but in facing the crises of health. My husband, as many of you know, is a physician, and he always remarks about the fact that illness he has found often brings out uh, in people who are not such great people the worst and in people who are great people the best. And your courage and insistence and victory in living a totally and full, complete life is important not just to you, your family, and your constituents, but it's been a remarkably important thing in the lives of so many people who are ill at any moment and look at you and say, it is possible to win a victory over amazing illness. So with that, let me thank you for being here and let me introduce our postmodern Senator Arlen Specter. Thank you very much, Roberta, for that splendid introduction. Uh, I noticed when uh, you mentioned Democrat that uh, half of the audience applauded. <laughs> Obviously a uh, bipartisan group. When you say well-known, uh, uh, the only way I can think of to have become better known would have been to have been indicted. <laughs> and uh, some people say there's not a whole lot of difference. <laughs> uh, thank you for your comments about uh, my uh, bout with uh, Hodgkins uh, and my response. Uh, just a comment or two about that. Uh, I uh, lost all my hair, which is what happens when you have Hodgkins. And uh, I was uh, presiding over the confirmation hearings of Chief Justice Roberts at the time, and suddenly I got more fan mail on my hairstyle than on my positions on public policy. <laughs> Had some suggestions that I should uh, wear to pay, to pay. I rejected that. Others that I should uh, shave my head and become a sex symbol. <laughs> Roberta, what's so funny about that? Look, look at how well it's worked for Rick Berkman. <laughs> but I decided not to shave my head and become a sex symbol for two reasons. One is that my wife was opposed to it. And with a reason like that, a guy wouldn't need a second reason. But I, <laughs> but I had one. I wasn't, uh, wasn't qualified. It's uh, a pleasure to be uh, with this distinguished group, find so many friends, uh, Flora Becker, a lifelong friend, uh, she and my wife Joan Levy and Lyman sat uh, together at uh, grade school, high school. And uh, her husband Ed and I were 
uh, lifelong friends at Penn and then again at uh, Yale. And say so many friends, uh, uh, Bill Coleman, who and I were assistant uh, counsel to the Warren Commission together, and Judge Pollack and George Freeman, uh, practically like, uh, like old home week. Whenever I begin a speech, I take out my watch, look at it carefully to give my audience a false sense of security that I'm going <laughs> to, that I'm going to pay attention to the time. But I told Roberta I'd leave time for uh, uh, dialogue, and I uh, and I will. Uh, it's a uh, uh, focus of attention uh, in this town today on a, a number of subjects that I want to talk about. Uh, uh, one is uh, the growth of uh, executive power, and uh, what uh, the Congress can do by way of oversight, which implicates the current controversy between Speaker Pelosi and the CIA. And then there's the issue of a, another nominee for the Supreme Court. Uh, all matters which uh, impact on the topic that I, I will address today. The period of time from uh, September 11th uh, to the present has seen the greatest expansion of executive authority, I think, in the, in the history of the country. And the uh, checks and balances have been very, very uh, inadequate. Uh, chairing the uh, Judiciary Committee, we were in the final stages of working on the Patriot Act on the Senate floor when the story broke about the terrorist surveillance program, warrantless wiretapping flat violation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And a uh, very difficult question as to whether the President had constitutional authority under Article II as Commander-in-Chief to supersede the statute. Well, it's uh, never been resolved to this minute. Uh, lots of efforts made to, to do so, including uh, my effort to subpoena the telephone companies Vice President Cheney, in a well-publicized move, went behind my back and uh, got enough dissenters so that we couldn't get those subpoenas issued. Uh, the federal court in uh, Detroit found the program unconstitutional. The Sixth Circuit found lack of standing over a very powerful dissent, a very flexible doctrine on uh, standing. I thought they should have taken it, and then the Supreme Court of the United States refused to take the case. And uh, uh, we still don't know the answer to that. I can't think of a – well, it's one of the most troubling uh, issues, I think, that the court could have confronted uh, in modern times. And uh, one of uh, the proposals that I am advocating to try to get it resolved and other issues like it is for – legislation to be passed where Congress would mandate the Supreme Court to decide the question. We have the authority to do that, as I understand the law, and uh, we ought to have a decision. Uh, that's a question I intend to ask the nominee. Can't uh, ask the nominee how the nominee is going to decide cases. We all know that. Uh, but I think it's a fair question to say, uh, what cases will you hear? What cases will you take? Uh, what cases will you duck? Then uh, uh, a similar problem, later corrected, occurred with the habeas corpus issue. Uh, the Congress went through gyrations uh, uh, to circumvent habeas corpus with the military tribunals, but then we were never really sure there was any habeas corpus requirement because uh, – uh, the Attorney General of the United States, Alberto Gonzalez, said there was no constitutional requirement for habeas corpus. That's a laugh line, guys. <laughs> I said to him, well, how about the clause that says habeas corpus may be suspended only in time of invasion or rebellion? Well, that didn't mean a whole lot to uh, Attorney General Gonzalez. And then uh, uh, the Supreme Court... Uh, uh, a first denied cert. Uh, only three justices said that ought to be taken. And then the, 
there was a damning article written by a lieutenant colonel who was intimately connected with the tribunals. And the behind-the-scenes speculation was that Justice Stevens did not join the three other justices to grant cert because he was concerned that if cert was granted, it would uh, lead to an unfavorable ruling. Uh, an article appeared in the New York Times commentary on that that looked uh, fairly authoritative, although really speculative. And uh, then on a petition for reconsideration of cert, which requires five votes, he got the five votes, and Justice Stevens and Justice Kennedy joined, and uh, uh, they upheld the right of habeas corpus. Uh, but that was a close call, too. Very, very big issue, which really needed to be decided by the, the Supreme Court. Then we have the signing statements. Uh, the Constitution, as you all know, has a presentment clause. The approach is Congress uh, presents uh, legislation to the president. He signs it or he vetoes it. And now we find uh, an era of uh, cherry-picking. And uh, on big matters, uh, on uh, uh, torture, uh, Senator McCain left the fight. Senate passed at 90 to 9. President and Senator McCain, President Bush and Senator McCain had a well-publicized rapprochement. Uh, 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 dealing with the issue specifically, the president signed it, and then he put on a signing statement taking it back. Uh, on the Patriot Act, one of the very key points for me was uh, oversight, and we negotiated that with the White House. Passed the Patriot Act, and then the president issues a signing statement, taking away uh, what, uh, what we were really uh, looking for there. And uh, I've introduced legislation pretty it's tough to deal with it in a legal context. You, you're going to have to get two-thirds to override a president. No president's going to say to you, I'll agree to uh, have court jurisdiction over my signing statements. And then there's a question of standing, but we really have to find some way to uh, get a judicial determination. And we have to have uh, uh, the court... Uh, uh, arbitrate these disputes. Congress, uh, Senate, Judiciary Committee uh, has very little ability to really deal with the expansion of executive authority uh, if we're not backed up by the, uh, by the Supreme Court. The uh, issue of uh, oversight has come very much into the public fore on the battle between the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the Central Intelligence Agency. And uh, it is a very important question as to what information we get on oversight from the Central Intelligence Agency. And the CIA has a very bad record when it comes to, uh, well, I was about to say being candid, that's too mild, uh, uh, to, to honesty. It goes back a long time to the mining of the harbors in uh, uh, Nicaragua, when uh, Senator Goldwater, then chairman of the committee, uh, took on uh, Director Casey, uh, picked up on uh, Iran-Contra. I was on the Intelligence Committee uh, in Iran-Contra, and uh, uh, Director Casey appeared and gave a perjurious testimony to the, uh, uh, to the committee. Uh, his uh, testimony was prepared by the deputy director, uh, who was then nominated to succeed him, and the nomination was withdrawn when uh, the deputy director was implicated in the preparation of the testimony, which was uh, uh, not accurate, and then came within a hair's breadth of being uh, prosecuted by uh, uh, independent counsel. Uh, during my chair tenure as chairman of the judicial of the uh, Intelligence Committee of the 104th Congress uh, repeated instances where didn't get information that that, uh, that was there. Uh, one situation arose, which uh, uh, candidly I wouldn't believe if uh, somebody told me about it. And uh, you can test uh, your own credibility on it. There was a key operative in the Central Intelligence Agency who started in the early 50s and was working through the 90s. And some 
information came from uh, the Soviet Union, which was tainted. And uh, knowing that it was tainted, uh, the official gave it to the President of the United States without telling the President it was tainted. Hard for me to believe that uh, that could be done. But I made inquiries as to the individual so that we could have a hearing with him. Uh, found out that he had retired, had a heart condition, and lived a few miles away in Virginia. And I went there with a stenographer and swore him in and took a deposition. And uh, his testimony was, uh, yes, I knew it was tainted. Well, why didn't you tell the people whom you gave it to, including the president, because uh, uh, they wouldn't rely on it? Well, weren't they entitled not to rely on it? No. My experience told me that it was accurate. Well, even if your experience told you that it was accurate, didn't you owe it to the president of the United States to tell him what the facts were? And he insisted on it. And then uh, questioning all the people, uh, uh, all the people around him. So uh, uh, it's a real, uh, it's a real uh, a problem as to how you get, uh, how you get the information. Uh, Director Panetta says that uh, uh, the agency is not in the, uh, not making a habit to misinform Congress, and uh, I, I believe that is true. It is not the policy of the Central Intelligence Agency to misinform Congress. Uh, the CIA has. Uh, uh, enormously devoted people all over the world. And when I was chairman, I visited many installations everywhere, high-risk operations and really devoted servants. But that doesn't mean that they're all giving uh, out the information. And there's an understandable reluctance to tell Congress, because Congress, uh, well, you know the old story, the ship of state leaks at the top, uh, well, leaks all the way up to the top. And uh, we've had people kicked off the Intelligence Committee for leaking information, had people subjected to criminal investigations for allegedly leaking information, and there's a great reluctance to, to say too much, and, and understandably so. There's a real tension that, uh, uh, that goes on there. Uh, and the current controversy involving uh, Speaker Pelosi and the CIA is very unfortunate, in my opinion, uh, because it uh, politicizes uh, the issue and it takes away attention from what ought to be the focus of attention, and that is how does the Congress get accurate information from the CIA? What do we do to get the information? All the brouhaha is about uh, who's right and who's wrong. Speaker Pelosi says she was misinformed, and that's immediately translated into she called him a liar, a little different. In fact, it's a lot different, saying you were misinformed as opposed to being a liar. And then one after another, for political uh, gain, people are uh, uh, making headlines and all the talk shows and here or there uh, and everywhere. And yesterday in Politico, I, I know it's a, it's a publication you read shortly before you take a look at the New York Times. <laughs> Not too many people here even know what Politico is with that modest response. Politico is one of the newspapers on, on Capitol Hill. But there was an article yesterday by uh, former Congressman Martin Frost, who presided over a hearing, co-presided over a hearing, shortly after 9-11. Uh, and he asked a question. Uh, uh, the briefer had said, uh, going along as uh, Frost describes it as a rambling explanation, uh, to a question asked by uh, uh, former Congressman Frost, uh, you're saying that the CIA knew about these three people and told the FBI, and then the FBI lost track of them, and they piloted planes, and as Frost described, a long, rambling description. And then uh, Frost said, uh, does that amount to a yes? And the uh, briefer said, yes, that amounts to, uh, to a yes. So. Frost comes to the conclusion that both uh, the CIA and uh, Speaker Pelosi could be uh, could both be telling the truth. Uh, I did a fair amount of work with uh, uh, Ms. Pelosi when she was a congresswoman on the subcommittee for Health and Human Services on conferences we had a uh, long time ago. 
I then saw her when I chaired the Intelligence Committee. She was one of the junior members on the House side of the Intelligence Committee. And I found her to be reliable and, and very able. But it is uh, my hope that uh, we'll put aside all the politicization and move to try to find uh, uh, an answer. And uh, I have a suggestion which uh, uh, is to uh, record the briefings. Uh, have a stenographer there have stenographers in all these uh, hearings which aren't exactly uh, worthy of a great deal of attention, uh, then there's no uh, dispute as to what was said. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, once the uh, notes disclosed, I, I think they ought to be, uh, in the interest of transparency, uh, I say that uh, Senator Shelby, who had been chairman of the committee following my chairmanship, uh, says they ought to be disclosed. He thinks that would settle the matter. Well, if they disclose, disclose uh, methods and uh, procedures, you can't uh, make them public, but uh, they could be inquired into by the intelligence committees, or if you think the intelligence committees uh, are composed only of Democrats and Republicans, find uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court or find somebody to look at them and make a public pronouncement as to what was done. Uh, I think uh, the Speaker is entitled to have uh, as much light shed on it as possible, and so is the public. The public's entitled to know uh, what went on there. But I'm going to suggest the, uh, a matter of uh, having notes of testimony. Uh, intelligence committees can do that as a matter of course, or the CIA can insist on it, or Congress could pass a law and requiring it. But... Uh, with a very sharp focus that this controversy has brought, I think that uh, really ought to, ought to be done. Uh, I yield the floor. Questions? It's uh, a wonderful thing to have the confidence that somebody as thoughtful and with your experiences in the rooms that we care about having people with those qualifications in. The senator has said he will take questions. Uh, he is going to come down to you uh, or toward you, and so there's a question right over there, Senator. Senator, in light of what you've just said, I'd be interested in your views on uh, revisions of the War Powers Amendment that have been discussed by the new administration and whether you think the War Powers Amendment in terms of the powers of the executive and the legislature in terms of use of force needs some rethinking as well. I think it would be a good idea to revisit the subject. Uh, I don't think the War Powers Act uh, works uh, and uh, it ought to be reexamined. Uh, how you deal with it and how we can top what Senator Javits did on it way back when remains to be seen, but I think it is uh, worth tackling. Uh, I had grave reservations about the authorization for the use of force uh, in uh, 2002. Uh, I did uh, some research and found that there was a real constitutional question as to whether Congress could uh, uh, delegate the authority to declare war. And the use of force really is a declaration of war. And the authority was to the effect that uh, uh, that decision had to be made at the time, depending on exactly what the circumstances were. And the Congress couldn't say, we'll leave it up to you, Mr. President, to uh, decide it in the future, depending on what you think. And the counter-argument on practicality was made, well, if the president's authorized to use force, maybe Saddam Hussein will back down. We won't have to use force. But that's not a very good uh, reason not to follow the Constitution. Over there, sir. Thank you very much, Senator, for your particularly your comments about the signing statements, which seem to me to be a very interesting subject, in part because we really don't find a place in the Constitution or elsewhere where they are envisioned. It seems to me that uh, the President can do whatever he wants after a statute has been adopted. 
at least his signing statements are a bit of transparency as to how he's planning to subvert the law. Uh, so uh, from that point good, of view... That's the first good thing I've heard about time. <laughs> I'm glad we're both here. <laughs> but um, the fact that he issues those uh, uh, is a sort of a flashpoint. But if he didn't do that, but he behaved the way that he said he was going to in the uh, signing statement, what is the constitutional remedy for that? I mean, I, I don't see that the issuance of the signing statements is that significant uh, uh, f from a legal point of view, and I wondered if you had a, another view on that. Well, uh, if uh, the president uh, uh, deviates from the law, that is to say violates the law, uh, there could be a judicial uh, challenge to it. Uh, and that, uh, and that, 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 that ought to be structured. Uh, the real problem comes uh, uh, not on the insult of the signing statement, but on the breach of the law. Uh, so uh, there would have to structure, structure a remedy for. Uh, we have remedies available. They're just not followed. It, how, how you can have uh, as big an issue as the terrorist surveillance program flat out against the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which provides the exclusive remedy, and a colorable contention that Article II supersedes a statute and not have it uh, adjudicated uh, still boggles me. Uh, that's going to be a big question that I'm going to put to uh, the nominee. Also, the habeas corpus question. These big issues, they're not too busy. Well, of course, if you can proceed whether he's prepared to sign the statement or not, the signing statement, this is the basis upon which he will proceed, I think. Well, uh, you could proceed after he violates the law, but uh, why not at the earliest point? And there's, and there's also a, uh, a quality of disregard of uh, uh, the separation of powers. I mean, what do we do in passing laws when the president with impunity says, uh, I'm not going to follow that part of it after he signs it? Notice my left-handed uh, uh, gesture. Uh, or uh, uh, especially after he negotiates it and then repudiates it. Senator That's Alder. what you call a mens rea. Sir, all the way over to the right now, all the way there, and then we'll come to you next. Good afternoon, Senator. Following up on your last answer, I think it'd be a fair statement to say that in the last 15 years or so, the Supreme Court confirmation process has become more politicized. What do you think is the proper role of the Senate in inquiring into nominees of the president when looking to confirm a Supreme Court appointee? Well, that's an evolving, uh, an evolving issue. Uh, not too long ago, prior to 1955, there uh, had been confirmation hearings only where there were some special questions raised. And uh, uh, after the confirmation proceeding as to Judge Bork, uh, who answered a lot of questions and had to after he had written that Indiana Law Review article on original intent and his other uh, pronouncements on the subject, uh, uh, there are many in the Senate who take the position that uh, there's not a whole lot of deference owed to the president. One time we thought that uh, the president made the selection, constitutional authority. The inquiry would be on uh, professional qualifications, education, and standing at the bar. Uh, that's, really, uh, that's really pretty much changed. And... Uh, uh, my view is still that the president's entitled to considerable, uh, uh, considerable deference. And when the, uh, when the hearings are politicized, uh, uh, the whole process is uh, political. Uh, president nominees campaign on the Supreme Court all the time. And uh, uh, they deal with all the cutting edges of, uh, uh, of the law. So... Uh, uh, I'd, I'd let the process take its course. I don't think we have uh, strayed too far. But then I participated in the Bork hearings. 
Senator, uh, one last question, which is all the way over there. The microphone is coming to you. Um, Senator, I was one of those who applauded when uh, you were introduced as a Democrat because I was wondering whether you could undertake to uh, educate some of your new colleagues on the relationship between habeas corpus and the courts and in the Congress, uh, as, you, as you pointed out. I the failed with the Attorney General. Well, what makes you think and, I can and, succeed and, with Senator? And, and you failed uh, in your brief uh, after, you know, in the United States Supreme Court because although you won the Supreme Court case, for the third time in the last five, six years, um, Congress came back and said, no, no, we really don't want habeas corpus. Uh, and most recently, we've had this kerfluffle about Guantanamo people being released in the United States. Finally, habeas corpus having been restored, a, a judge actually ordered release. The D.C. Circuit promptly reversed that and said, no, there's not this power. There's a cert petition pending in which presumably it would be decided, yes, there's a power, no, there's not. There are conditions, there are constraints, and this is how habeas corpus is supposed to work. And now the Senate You sound Democrats, like a circuit Senate, judge. You lost me. The Senate, 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 Democrat, the Senate Democrats proposed to preclude all that by legislation in the defense appropriations bill to preclude any release into the United States, and I'm just wondering why the Congress should cut off the judicial remedies that way, certainly in advance of um, letting the judiciary do its work. Why should the Congress do it? Well, the answer to that is the Congress shouldn't do it. And uh, the next question is, does the Congress have the authority to do it? I don't think uh, the Congress does. I don't think the Congress has the authority to tell the uh, uh, the circuit court it doesn't have a jurisdiction on a constitutional issue. We had quite a quite a discussion with the Chief Justice Rehnquist on his confirmation hearing in 1986 about that. Uh, and uh, after a lot of uh, uh, discussions, uh, the Chief Justice, uh, he was justice then, uh, said uh, you couldn't take away the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court on First Amendment issues. I don't think uh, I don't think we can. We, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in a real snarl on uh, a related subject. Uh, since that's the last question, I'm going to uh, add just a little to it. Uh, Please. On, on the business of uh, uh, the, uh, the telephone companies, you have uh, some 40 cases pending in federal court with the telephone companies, and people are claiming a violation of constitutional rights. And... Uh, uh, what the telephone companies have gotten uh, is uh, uh, very, very valuable, very, very valuable. Hadn't been publicly disclosed. And of course, we can't say what it is, but it's very, very valuable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I introduced an amendment that uh, would put the government in the shoes of the telephone companies. So you don't uh, penalize the good citizen telephone companies. Government has to take over the case, and if they're Damages or whatever the government has to has to pay for them. that that amendment uh, was defeated, and uh, now there's an issue as to whether President Obama is going to uh, assert uh, that in the telephone cases. Uh, I, I don't know what he's going to do, and uh, I ultimately voted for uh, the bill on immunity because I didn't want to lose the information, and it uh, pained me to do that. But uh, but I made that decision. But what it really does, when you take away, give them immunity, you're taking away the jurisdiction of the court. And I think the court could come back and say, uh, uh, you can't do that, uh, circuitously, or no matter, uh, no matter how you do it. Uh, and I think it is very important for the court to assert its jurisdiction on constitutional issues so that somebody decides between the Congress and the president as to, as to what is going on. Uh, as we've had an evolution of the powers of the three branches, I think it has been blamed that the executive has far outstripped the Congress in authority and ability to, for the executive to do what it wants over the will of the Congress, and the only restraint is the uh, court. And uh, I think the American Law Institute ought to do something about it. That's why I came. <laughs> Thank you.
Senator, we, we thank you so gratefully for your time, the wisdom of and interest of your words, your candor and willingness to take questions, and you've given me a trifecta. We've had three speakers this meeting. They've all given us assignments. So now on to uh, speaking of kerfluffles. We will adjourn and in 10 minutes begin nonprofits. Thank you. <laughs>